The car world is such a confusing place to be right now. So Ford has stopped selling the Fiesta. Volvo has stopped making estate cars. And the best selling car in the whole world at the moment has got farting indicators. And if that wasn't madness enough, then this company, Smart, no longer makes two-seater cute little city cars because this is the Smart hashtag one. And as you can see, it is definitely not a two-seater. But before I tell you everything you need to know about the Smart hashtag one, then please do hashtag subscribe to the channel because if you love hashtag electric cars as much as we do, then this is the hashtag place to be. I'll stop with the hashtag stuff now. Let's get the name stuff out of the way, shall we? This is quite possibly the daftest name for a new car that we've come across since the Mitsubishi Lettuce or the Great Wall Wing or mm, that is a real name. Or my personal favourite, the Mazda Bongo. I love a Bongo. Um, and do let me know your ridiculous car names in the comments below. But here at electrifying.com, we know that we need to look beyond the names. And we know from our earlier videos and from our other social channels that you are really interested in this car. So let's start with a bit of background. So remember the old 4.2 and the old 4.4 models? Well, forget them completely because that was old smart. This is new and improved smart. And this car, the hashtag one, is the result of a joint venture between Mercedes and Geely the Chinese company that owns Volvo, Polestar, Lotus, a bit of Aston Martin. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but in essence, Mercedes was in charge of the bits that you can see, and Geely sorted out all the bits that you can't, which I reckon was probably the right way to divvy things up. So underneath the body is a set of underpinnings, or the platform or hardware, that Geely will also be using for the forthcoming Volvo EX30, which we'll be driving in a couple of months. Now, that's all the nerdy stuff dealt with. So what's gonna to matter to most buyers is how it looks and how it performs. So let's take a look. The hashtag one is 4.3 meters long, 1.8 meters wide and 1.6 meters high, which makes it bigger than the Vauxhall Corsa E and about the same size as a VW ID3 or a Mini Countryman. The design is not going to be to everyone's taste and I think it works better from some angles than others. Side on, I really like. Front three quarters, maybe not so much, but overall I'd say Mercedes has done a good job. I particularly like the floating roof and these illuminated door handles that pop out are a really nice touch. It is though a little strange to find roof rails on a five door hatchback. Smart has been a bit more adventurous in here. Now, although this whole dashboard centre console structure does take a bit of getting used to at first, it is a brave decision um, given that this isn't a huge car, but actually I do quite like it and I love the fact that it's colour coded and not just that shiny piano black. I'm not sure how uh, wider, bigger drivers will get on with it, but if you do fit in here, and I do, then there is a lot to like. So you've got your obligatory iPad stuck here on the back of the dashboard. There's a little secondary display there embedded just beyond the steering wheel and you do also get a head up display. So you'll be sport for choice when it comes to getting your information on the move. One thing I love in here is all the storage. So you've got a really good sized glove box in there, but that is only the start of it. Um, underneath here is that lovely freedom of space that you get. Good size space in there, loads of room to chuck a handbag in. Um, and then moving up to this sort of central island here at the front, wireless charging, your um, charger points here in the middle, okay-ish size cup holders, but another little compartment there. But this is the best bit, because in here, there's a little cooling compartment. And look, it's filled with chocolates and sweeties, which are all nice and cool. I don't think they come as standard with the car though, sadly. Um, but I think that is absolutely brilliant for what will ultimately be often used as a family car. Such a nice way of keeping, you know, kids' snacks and drinks and things cool. Um, yeah, I think that's really clever. I also like this little charging card slot in there. I don't tend to use charging cards a lot, but I know quite a few people that do, and it's just a really handy place to keep them. I think this is all very well considered. But as impressive as all these little storage areas are, what impresses me most in here is the quality. It doesn't feel cheap in here at all. 
you've got nice soft touch materials where you need them to be. The cost cutting materials are saved for the bottom half down there. Um, the stitching is really nice. It's all really well done. Got a good adjustment in both the seat and the steering wheel. Um, oh, and I do also love this. Come out. I love the key. Isn't that nice? Just unlock, lock and boot, which is all you need. I'd probably like it even more if there was a key card and an app and no key at all. But as keys go, I think this one is lovely. And I also like the way you can just tuck it in there whilst you're driving. So let's have a look at the infotainment system. Right, to um, help you understand where everything is, Smart has added a virtual assistant in the form of a fox who's now playing with the ball. I've got no idea why the fox is there. Are they very helpful at finding things? Bins, perhaps? Who knows? I'm also not sure how I feel about having a, an assistant, albeit a lovely fox who's now having a nap, um, to steer me around the myriad of screens that this system has got. I actually think I'd have liked Smart to perhaps have spent a bit more time focusing on its usability because there is an awful lot going on in here. Um, I've been sat here trying to think what it reminds me of because it's got this sort of little world in the middle and foxy down there at the bottom. And it reminds me of when my son was little and you could get those kind of pretend tablets for them for little kids that weren't quite, you know, the, uh, the iPads with all that functionality. And there's something about it that reminds me of that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of this infotainment system, I've got to say. I mean, part of the problem for me is that everything is in here the air con the heating controls i know i bang on about it all the time but i do just like a few physical buttons and those animations also seem to just slow everything down it feels quite a laggy system yeah i don't know i think it was probably better to have spent less time focusing on the cute fox and more time focusing on the functionality all right then Ooh, i like those the sort of colour coded bit here in the back. Um, but yeah, there's loads of space back here. Now, because this was designed as an electric car from the ground up, that means the designers didn't have to make room for things like engines and tunnels for all the exhaust gubbins. Um, so what that means is you do get a lot of space. In fact, there is the same amount of space in the back that you will find in a Mercedes E-Class which is quite astonishing really, isn't it? Um, and what I do like about it back here is that it's not an afterthought. One thing that struck me in the VW ID3 was that when you got in the back, it really felt like the quality dipped, but it doesn't feel like that here. You've still got nice soft touch plastics. Uh, you know, the trim looks nice. The stitching's had care and attention put into it. This is a really, really nice place to be. But most of all, it's a very spacious place to be. I'm only five foot four. And look, even with this fantastic glass panoramic sunroof, which just floods loads of light in here, there is excellent headroom. I just spotted something in these little rear quarter lights. There's like a little cartoony thing of the, uh, of the car, uh, which there also is actually a diff slightly different one in the, uh, in the front as well. I do love an Easter egg. Oh, there's another one in the back window. Oh, and that's got like a little tornado in front of it. And also, before I forget, I'm a sucker for a frameless door. I really like those. I think it just elevates the whole thing. Underneath the floor is a 62 kilowatt hour battery pack, which delivers an official range figure of 273 miles. We haven't been driving it for long today, and it's not really a fair test. So we will report back on the real world driving range when we get it for longer. The Hashtag One comes with a 264 brake horsepower motor that drives the rear wheels, just like the original Smart. It can go from 0 to 62 in 6.7 seconds and has a top speed of 112 miles per hour. And if that simply isn't fast enough for you, then how about the Brabus version? With 422 brake horsepower, all-wheel drive, and a 0 to 62 mile per hour time of 3.7 seconds. But that will cost you £43,450, so around £4,500 more than the premium version we're driving here. Oh, and if towing is your thing, the Hashtag One can handle a braked trailer at up to 1,600 kilograms.
Oh, so let's kick off with brake regeneration. One of my favorite characteristics of electric cars. So you have a couple of different options, along with an option for a true one pedal driving mode. Unfortunately, you have to fiddle around in the menu to activate them, fancy that. The Fox doesn't do it for you either, Blue Fox. So the button down here that does bring it up straight away, um, so I can put it into standard or strong or um, activate, <laughs> activate even. Uh, see, I'm looking away from the, the screen, that's not good, is it? Um, eh, activate e-pedal, there we go. Um, and when you activate e-pedal, you get a screen that pops up. You have to wait 10 seconds in order for it to, to come on. And it's quite irritating because every time you turn the car off, uh, e-pedal mode goes off, so you've got to reactivate it all again. Um, and then once I'm actually in e-pedal, I just don't think the setup is quite right. So I've been driving around in this for about an hour, and it just feels like there's a bit of a lag between when you lift off uh, the accelerator pedal and when the regenerative braking is actually engaged. I don't know, this just doesn't feel right. It's not the best uh, regen system uh, that I've tried. Other than my moans about regeneration, this is a very pleasant car to drive. I really like how the suspension is set up. It's pretty Goldilocks. Not too firm, not too soft. It feels just right. It really soaks up bumps and lumps on the road quite well. Um, and look, whilst going into corners isn't anything to write home about, there's very little in the way of body roll and it feels nice and composed and balanced. The setup is more aimed at comfort than driving fun, but I think that suits the car well. The motor is quiet, you've got good soundproofing in here, and it all makes it feel quite a relaxing place to be in here. It actually feels more refined to me than, um, say, a VW ID3, which I've recently spent some time in. Although it has to be said that it can't quite match the VW's impressive turning circle, but still, it does feel very refined. So it's rear wheel drive like the ID3, so you get a lovely push when you hit the accelerator there, really nice and peppy, and there's no scrabbling for the front wheels. It does pack quite a surprising punch, actually. 0 to 62 takes an impressive 6.7 seconds, although it does feel quicker than that actually when you get your foot down. And it's got a really nice pickup when you get it out on a faster stretch of road like this. Very steady, very smooth, but you know, lots of peppiness for overtaking. So let's talk charging, shall we? Opt for anything other than the entry level Pro Plus model, and the good news is that you get 22 kilowatt AC charging as standard which is great news. We're big fans of that at electrifying. Rapid chargers, well that peaks at 150 kilowatts, which is on par with its rivals. Smart reckons that a 10 to 80% charge will take just under half an hour, which is fine. And incidentally, once you step up from the entry level model, you also get a heat pump, a very welcome addition, because this will help keep the range up on those colder winter days. From launch, the UK range consists of four models. Pro Plus, Premium and Brabus, along with a special launch edition. Prices range from £35,950 for the entry-level model up to £43,450 for the range-topping Brabus. All models come with a three-year unlimited mileage warranty, with the battery packs covered by an eight-year or 125,000-mile guarantee. I think we have determined that this isn't a smart car in the traditional sense and in fact nobody at Smart is even suggesting that this is a replacement for the old Smart 4.2 or even 4.4 models. This is a new start for Smart and I actually think they've done a pretty good job with the hashtag one. Apart from perhaps the name, which is just truly awful isn't it? Anyway, putting aside the name for a minute, it might not be as revolutionary as the original smarts were, but as Mercedes accounts will no doubt show, being different rarely pays the bills. I say that this is just different enough to make it stand out from its rivals, but it won't scare people off. The quality is very good, it drives well, the price is competitive. And whilst I'm not in love with the way it looks, I do think it's got a certain something about it, which has surprised me. In fact, generally, I've gone from being quite indifferent about this car to really looking forward to driving it again for longer. But as always, what do you think? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. That little icon is around here.